All right, lots of math details ahead in this lecture, but stay tuned at the very end. There is another attack, there's another application of the Coppersmith method to finding, uh, well, in this case, stereotype messages. So how, if somebody gives you a form and only the last part is different, and you know that this was encrypted without any fancy padding like OEP, then we show how this can be broken. So stay on. Let me start by explaining a little bit about this LAL. I said in the last lecture we're going to use this as a black box. I want you to a little bit open the lid on this black box. Not, not much. I mean, it's not going to be scary. Um, we're just going to look into what it does. Now, what we're giving it is a set of vectors. So I assume that everything is over the d-dimensional space. So we have vectors of length d and we're having d of those. And I'm entering each of these vectors as a row. So remember from the last example, so there was the vector x squared ax, and there was a vector x a, so it was x squared x a 0, 0, um, x a, and 0, 0, n. Those were three vectors, and then I put them into the rows of a matrix. I run this LIO, as I said, a black box for now, and then it outputs a matrix with shorter vectors. That was in this matrix B, where we put, took this first uh, vector and built the polynomial Q. And well, it has some vectors Vj prime, such that each of those Vj primes is an integer linear combination of the inputs. <sighs> integer linear combination is, is quite a mouthful. What does it mean? Is what it means is simply that we're taking the original vectors, these Vi's here, and then we're allowed to take integers as coefficients. So two times one vector, or two times one vector plus three times the other, or that minus four times the next, whatever integers you want to pick. So the outputs of L, L are again D vectors. It's a full size row. Each of these is typically shorter than the input vector. Well, okay, if you feed it something which is already short, it can't get nicer. If you feed it the identity matrix, it will output the identity matrix. But in general, on random inputs of d vectors, the outputs are shorter and they are more orthogonal to one another. So if you're taking um, pairwise dot products, you're getting closer to zero. So the angle between those vectors is small. And, well, these are just integer combinations. Now, you have seen some matrix operations, I assume, which was to diagonalize the matrix and even to get it onto what's called Gramm-Schmidt orthogonalization. So in that one, you are making the vectors orthogonal. You're getting um, ones on the diagonal and then some other stuff. Um, but what you're doing in those steps is normally you're running through all the vectors and then you're looking at the remaining coefficients. And then you're figuring out how often do you have to take this row, multiply it, add it to the next one, so that you can uh, eliminate all the coefficients there. And the way that this works is you're taking the inner product of the well, current vector with the other vector you want to erase. So you have the i vector, so you have the j vector that you want to use to reduce the others, and here you're running through all the previous positions. And then you're taking those previous vectors which are already shortened, so these are the ones with the uh, star there, you're doing the inner product or dot product, that means first coefficient times first coefficient plus next coefficient times next coefficient plus etc. So this is how many times you're doing these, scaled by the length of this vector. Okay, so this is an integer, this is an integer, but then you're getting a fraction of integers. I mean, it's an integer if your inputs were integers, but then you're getting fractions, so you quickly land over the rational numbers not over the integers. And then, okay, you're updating your vector to be this thing. So you're taking the vj that you had, turning into vj star, by subtracting all of the other ones. That means you're making all the first positions zero, and then comes a non-zero coefficient, and then comes random stuff. And then you go into the next one. Uh, so now you have all of those to put these to zero, etc., etc. So this is how you're going down. Now these mu i j, those are not integers. So we can't use those in LL, but we can say, well, they give us a good approximation. They are kind of the closest, these are the ones you would like to have. 
So this is how much we should subtract. But if this is 3.8, well, probably we should subtract four times. And so that's what LL is doing there. It subtracts an integer multiple, which is guided by these new coefficients. There's a stopping criterion. So L, uh, uh, a matrix is LL reduced for some parameter delta. Um, if each of these mu's after it, so we will still compute the same mu values. If each of those is less than or equal to one half for all of the pairs, except for not on the diagonal, so it's i being different from j. And then for length of the vectors, we have that the previous vector is shorter than the next vector. So here we have a vi minus one star is less than the vi star. Well, and this is where these deltas comes in. This is where you having the, the mu i's coming in. So the mu i minus one i. So this is the um, shared coefficient, the, 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 no, the coefficient between these two vectors. Okay, so, well, what we normally do is we run this with delta equals one half. And so then you have one half minus the coefficient of this thing is less than the next vector. The guarantee that this gives you is that the first vector is relatively short, where shortness is, well, depending on delta, that's this parameter here, depending on the size of the matrix, so it's a D by D matrix, because of D vectors coming in, all those living in D dimensional space, and the determinant of this matrix here comes in. Well, for the matrix that we're seeing, we can compute this thing, and then it tells us how short this vector is going to be. Also note, it's the dth root of the determinant that comes in. Okay, I have copied the LL algorithm for you. I'm not going to go through it in detail. I'm just going to highlight the steps we're seeing. So here is the place where we're computing these mu ij, or mu jk in this case, because, well, it's a different uh, numbers here. And then um, we're updating those. But now, well, we're reducing, so the um, red routine is a reducing where we're taking from when vector or we're taking from one vector as many times the previous vector away according to q. And q is the nearest integer to the mu jk. So that's why I said, well, if it's 3.8, you probably want to take four times. If it's three or three, you probably want to take three times. So this is how you update those. So now the vector has gotten closer to what the vj was. Um, all the confusion that vj can do to vk are done and you update. And sometimes you notice that the previous vector is now longer, the one that you used to reduce is now longer than the next one, and then you want to swap the order. So instead of the data flow in the normal Gram-Schmidt where you're going through just once, well, these steps, and then each of those steps gets a bit more expensive because you have to do all the coefficients until there, here you actually backtrack, you're swapping, and then you're looking back, well, can you now reduce some more? And so Thijs Lohofen made a very nice uh, visualization of how the data flow works in the LL algorithm. So you can download uh, his lecture notes. Um, I've only gotten it to work with actual read, um, not with events. So your mileage may vary on what it works. But if you get it to, ver to work, it's pretty nice. I also recorded some video about LL in a different lecture where I'm using uh, actual read for, for showing exactly those slides. So I can link to that as well. Okay, so this explains a little bit the black box that LL is. The rest will remain a black box. I mean, you can see everything, but it doesn't show you why the output is so good. And actually, the output of LL is typically a bit better than what we can prove. Anyway, it gives you a guarantee, and that's good enough for what we're going to use here. Okay, the next ingredient we need is a theorem by Hogarth Graham. So what I actually showed you when I said Coppersmith method is the method by Coppersmith in an instantiation due to Haugraf Graham. So uh, Nick Haugraf Graham said, okay, well, let's, let's make this a little bit more manageable. Let's come up with a, a nice way to use this. And we first need the theorem that he proved. And we're gonna give a proof of it as well. So if we're given some polynomial, and this G, that's the output of our algorithm. So we're putting in some polynomial F, then we're getting this matrix, we're running LL and then we're getting this polynomial G. And then let this polynomial G have degree D minus one, 
there is some condition that we know. We know that it has a root x0, that was the r from our previous part. So there is some root and we know a bound on this root. This was the 2 to the 160 there. So it's a root mod p, or exactly it is p here, and we know a bound on it. So that's the first condition. This is how, well, the first row, the second row, the third row, these are all 0 mod p. But actually we can do this in more generality, so I'm going to have some b to the k running around here. So both b and k are integers greater than 0. And then the second condition that I have to test is if this polynomial here satisfies that the Euclidean norm of it is upper bounded by b to the k, the same as the modulus here, divided by square root of d, where d minus 1 is the degree of the polynomial. All right, so what is this Euclidean norm? So this is taking the coefficient vector of g of x times x. So the, the constant term, well, that's g0. This is g1x until gd x to the d. So that's all well, this point on here, except for we're also plugging in uppercase x. And then Euclidean norm means we're squaring each entry, we're summing them up, and we take the square root. Okay, so if for this polynomial it happens such that these two conditions are satisfied, then the theorem says then the polynomial actually has a root over the integers. It's not just the root mod b to the k, that's what we put in, un, in under the first argument, but it's actually a root over the integers. And again, a root of the integers is what we really want to have because those are efficiently computable. Okay, so let's prove that. I'm going to use some stuff from linear algebra, so I'm going to deal with vectors here. And again, if this is too abstract, please fast forward or whatever, stay in this video, go to the last slide at least. Okay, so here's one vector. It is the vector 1, x0 divided by x, x0 squared divided by x squared, all the way up to x0 to the d minus 1 divided by x to the d minus 1. Now note that each of those, so x is upper bounded by x. I should have said that the entry in absolute value is less than 1. So each of these here, the absolute value is less than 1. And then the other vector I need is the coefficient vector here of this polynomial g of x. Well, okay, so this is that guy, except for, well, I'm squaring things here. But this is the coefficient vector of g of x times uppercase x. If I multiply those, again, this is the dot product, so I'm taking this times this one, so it's positional, so I'm taking the first entry times the first entry, second entry times the second entry, third entry times the third entry. Okay, so those cancel the uppercase x, so there's a divided by x, there's a times x. There's a divided by x squared, there's a times x squared. So then I'm just having g0 times 1 plus g1 x0 plus g2 x0 squared, all the way up to g d minus 1 times x0 d minus 1. Okay, so that is actually the polynomial g of x evaluated at x of 0. So this dot product of v and w is that one. Okay, so now I need another thing from, well, you will have seen this if you look at length of vectors, namely the Kulshi-Schwartz inequality. So if you take the absolute value of this inner product, then it is shorter than the length of the first vector times the length of the second vector. You're getting less or equal normally, um, well, with equality exactly if they are parallel. In this case, we are not linearly dependent, so I have a strict inequality there. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't damage too much, I have less than equal, but I want a strict inequality later. Okay, so I have an upper bound on my g of x0, given by the length of this vector times the length of this vector. And this is again the Euclidean length theorem. So this is the normal length in the vector space. So if you're asking in, say, two-dimensional space, you're getting to a point, how far away is this? You're taking the x-coordinate squared plus the y-coordinate squared, and then the square root of this to get the, the radius. 
Now in upper bound on this w, we know that each of the uh, coefficients here in absolute value is, is bounded by one. Well, we square it in this computation of the, the norm. And so this is one plus one plus one plus one plus one. Plus one. Oh, okay, so there are d terms here. So this is square root of d. And the other one, this uh, length of w, well, that's the size of the g of x. I mean, that's the exact that guy. Okay, so we can now use the cauchy schwarz inequality and that the dot product between those guys is g of x0 to get that the absolute value of g of x0 is equal to, well, that thing, which is less than that thing mm -hmm, here, the square root of d is nicely cancel. There's the divided by square root of d coming in from partition 2. There's the length of v computed here, which has a positive, it has a plus, or sorry, times square root of d, so those two cancel. And so we're getting that the um, absolute value of g of x is upper bounded by b to the k. Well, we know already it is zero modulo b to the k. But now we're also getting that it's less than b to the k. Well, that means that it's equal to zero. So let's think about this in, for a moment. If you have something which is zero mod b to the k, then well, if it's smaller than b to the k, where could it go? I mean, the next value that it's, it's either 0 or plus b to the k or minus b to the k, but if the absolute value is less than b to the k, I should have put a, a g of x here to make it match the previous one, I just see. So this is just, in, if some number is less than b to the k, then it must be identical to 0. Okay, so we have now proven that, well, this theorem here, so then g of x0 is equal to the 0 over the integers. You still there? Good. So now let's, let, let's look at how we get this. I mean, we need to find this polynomial. We want to find this g. We know we can get this g from the LL algorithm, but we also need to find this polynomial, these, these matrices. How do we build those? Okay, so we, what we know about this g is that it's in b to the k times c. So it's a, it's a multiple of b to the k. It's congruent to 0 mod b to the k when you evaluate at x0. All right, so it could be, for instance, that the whole polynomial is just a constant. It's just, well, b to the k times some integer. It's a pretty boring polynomial, so let's make it a bit larger. We can also times do plus b to the k times x times some integer. Uh, the same with squares cubes, etc. You see how this goes and you can, well, you haven't actually used any property yet. At this moment, you might as well go for constant. The interesting thing is when we know that there's another polynomial, this polynomial f that we started with. In the case of uh, factoring p with no bits, it was this polynomial um, a plus x. And we know that for the right root, this gives us zero. So for the right x0, that's the one we're looking for, it is also in this b to the k c. So in our case, we're taking b to the k to be n. And so then, well, also this polynomial is a multiple of it. And so we can also continue with that. So we're taking all the um, bk times x, bk, uh, bk, bkx, b to the k, x squared, etc., up to, well, one less than the degree of t. So f of x has degree t, then we need to go up to degree t minus 1 here. So we do not need an extra b to the k in f because, well, f of the right x0 is already common to 0 mod b to the k. And sometimes this is enough, but sometimes we need more terms. Sometimes we also need to have an extra x in front of the f, an extra x squared, etc. So, okay, we can get more and more polynomials. All of these polynomials will satisfy that this g of x evaluated at x0 is a multiple of b to the k. Now, in our case, there are two difficulties. One is, well, we don't know b to the k. 
I mean, we want to use p to the k being p, but we don't have p, so we can't set up this thing at all. I mean, I have this polynomial f, so I can set up this part, but I don't have this constant. But I know multiple of b to the k. So I know that, well, b to the k being p, I know n is a multiple of p. So I can set up a matrix, well, that would be the smallest here. Instead of using b to the k, I can use n. So instead of using p, I can use n. Okay, so this would be taking just this first term as a constant, so n times z, and then this polynomial f being x plus a. 2 by 2 is too small. I'm not putting here the calculations, but you would need to know most of the bits of p to have any success chance here. So 2 by 2 is not going to work, so we're going to use this for a 3 by 3 matrix. That's also what we've seen in the examples. So for a 3 by 3 matrix, again, two things happen. We needed to, instead of using b to the k equals p, which is what we actually want to do, we have to use n here. So we can also use multiples of the thing that we actually want to have on those. And then, well, the degree of the polynomial is still just 1. And so, well, we still only have to have a constant term, and we will be filling in more polynomials. So we are in the case that we're getting this 3 by 3 matrix here. So this is the 2 by 2 matrix that we had set on the previous slide. And then we're filling in times x, times x squared, etc. And so this is where we get the previous row. And remember again that Calgrave Graham wants to have this uppercase x, the bound on the root, also to come in. So not just taking the polynomial f of x, but taking the polynomial of f of uppercase x, lowercase x. So that's where all these guys come in. Okay, now putting it all together. So here we have a matrix. And then we run LL on it. And then from the LL slide, we know that the first vector, this first row that we're going to get out, satisfies that our vector, this well, Euclidean norm of this vector here, after LL, not of the input here, is less than or equal to this expression. Let's plug in all the values. So D, the, D, the dimension, so this is a 3 by 3 matrix, so D is 3. And then we're going to use um, LL typically for delta equals 1 half. So that turns the 4 times delta into 2. 2 minus 2, 1 is just 1. So we're having 2 here. Well, 2 to the power 3 minus 1 is 2 divided by 2. So it's just the 2. Fine. And then the determinant of M. Now this determinant is easy to compute because it's a 3 by 3 matrix. Also, it has a lot of zeros. There are only... Um, there's only one of the diagonals, so if you know the Kramer's rule for evaluating it, it's just the main diagonal, because each of the other diagonals has zeros, also of the anti-diagonals. There's always at least one of the zeros. So the determinant here is x squared times x times n, also known as x cubed times n. And then there's a 1 over d there, so it's a 1 third. Right. So the Euclidean norm on the coefficient vector of this shortest thing that comes out is 2 times the third root of x cubed times n. Okay, the third root of x cubed cancels out nicely, so we're having 2 times x on the outside and then cube root of n. Now we want this, and this is where Hogarth um, Graham comes in, we want this to be smaller than that b to the k divided by d. So d is again 3, and our b to the k, well, I said this is actually p, because the first equation, that x plus a, that one holds mod p. It doesn't hold mod, mod n. So that is our p here. And now, well, I'm assuming that about p and q are about the same, so both of those are about the square root of n. So I'm looking here at x, about 2x times the third root of n, being less than the square root of n divided by 3, square root of 3. Also known as, well, x is upper bounded by this expression. So that's where I took the 160 from, because I know if I have all bits of p except for the bottom 160, the 3 by 3 matrix is guaranteed to work. 
Nice. So we have now understood everything there. We understood, I mean, we've proven the Hogwarts frame theorem. We're taking a bit of a black box for when LLL works and how short these are, but uh, taking this as an axiom, then we actually have proven that this method will work. Now, as promised, there's another fun one. So let's look at something else which can go wrong with RSA. Now, I have said already you shouldn't use schoolwork RSA, and you should certainly not use schoolwork RSA with a very small exponent, like exponent 3. But, well, let's assume we do this. So, one thing that could go wrong is that the message is so small that we don't see a reduction. Now, I'm taking tiny primes here, just 160 bits, so that's not it. Um, my message here is my favorite subject is cryptology. Who would have guessed? Um, the 36 here means I'm taking a base 36 encoding, so that's the 26 letters of the alphabet and the integers, so I can actually encode every letter uniquely and every integer. And so that's my message, and then the ciphertext is the cube power of that. And because, well, both of these P and Q are so small, you will see a reduction happening. But this is still a weak system at least assuming that this is kind of a form text. So assuming that you know that this is coming from something which takes my favorite subject is, and then you just have a bunch of characters here. Now, coincidentally, this is exactly as long as cryptology, but you could put there biology 111 or something, or biology 101. It's a bit of a made-up example. It would be more likely that you have password of the day is, and then you have eight characters in the bad old days. Maybe eight characters plus numbers. Now, if you know that the text comes from such a form where you just don't know this bottom part, we can actually also match this up with the Hogarth Graham idea. Namely, in this case, we're not aiming for factoring n, but we're aiming for recovering the message. So we know that we have the message being, well, a known part, which is given by this A here, and some unknown part, which is getting the bedden parts here, the subject. And we know that for N, the polynomial, well, we know the ciphertext, we have an idea of what the plain text looks like, and we're missing what the last parts are. But we know that the encryption, this is just using exponent 3, so we know that there was a 3 there. So this one, this polynomial, is 0 mod n for the right value of x. And now this is a nice example because our b to the k is actually n, and we have n. So now we can build the matrix exactly as the uh, whole frame suggests. So we have n being b to the k, so we have n, this polynomial has to be so we need n, n times x, n times x squared, and then the polynomial. So let's put this into the matrix. So here is n, n times x, n times x squared. Remember this is the x, which is the upper bound, and the way that the, um, the integers are arranged, z is the largest of them. So if I'm putting all z's here, then I'm guaranteed to have an upper bound for whatever the part that I don't know here is. So this uh, base 36 goes 0 to 9, a till z. So this one is the largest number that I can encounter there. Okay, and then this polynomial that I have here, again I have to evaluate the uppercase x times x, so I'm getting an x cubed, I'm getting, well, the next part is 3x squared a, and 3x times a squared, and a cubed minus c, that's constant term. I put this into a sage, I ask Sage to run LL. <coughs> I get a polynomial. And cryptology. So the answer of this thing is because we have the stereotype message, because we could guess what the message looked like, except for we didn't know the bottom part of the form. So then running LL with all these ideas from Coppersmith and Howgrave Graham. We actually guaranteed to get the right answer. Now we're not guaranteed that this is always in the first route. 
so things could go wrong <sighs> sorry too dry uh, so things can go wrong either if we have misjudged the sizes you might get a constant polynomial then you have to upgrade the numbers or what might happen is that you uh, seeing more than one root and then you have to try all the possible routes whether they work anyway that's all i wanted to show you about the coppersmith attack method this is a very typical method you, if you're doing capture the flag exercises you might encounter this again and now you know a little bit more of why it works when it works